Dr. Atchison here, and we are talking about operant condition, operant conditioning, which is again a kind of learning. So as we said in the last lecture, learning is a permanent change relatively um, in a behavior that's brought about by a repeated experience. This can't be due to kind of innate or instinctive processes and is not part of maturation. So we've already talked about classical conditioning. Today we're going to talk about operant conditioning. Um, this is primarily brought about by B.F. Skinner. Um, and then what he's saying is, and what operant condition is saying is, that the probability, probability of a voluntary response. Remember in classical conditioning, we were talking about involuntary responses. So things that just naturally happened. Um, this is saying our voluntary responses, those are increased or decreased by this association with a consequence. This is, um, and then we can see these observable behavior responses because of that. Again, this is a kind of associative learning um, where our voluntary responses are being paired with some sort of consequence, whether it be a reinforcement or a punishment. Whereas classical conditioning was our involuntary responses are being paired with a neutral stimulus. And then that neutral stimulus starts to carry meaning and becomes a conditioned stimulus um, where we can get that conditioned response. So again, classical conditioning, we've already talked about this. Um, these are these automatic reactions. The stimulus is always preceding the behavior and is eliciting the behavior. Um, and these associations are being made between our unconditioned stimulus and our conditioned stimulus. Where in classical, where in operant conditioning, um, the organisms are associating their own voluntary behavior with its consequences. Um, stimulus that follows um, the response and strengthens it, okay? So there's a behavior and then the stimulus happens after the behavior. Um, and there's two kinds of stimulus that can happen. We can have um, reinforcers, which will increase the likelihood of that behavior happening again. And we can have punishers, which are going to decrease the likelihood of that behavior happening again. So the book talks about, again, this organisms associating their own actions um, with reinforcement, whether it be increasing by positive reinforcement or decreasing by negative reinforcement. Now, all of operant conditioning really came out um, of research by a guy named Thorndike. And we're going to watch a video that kind of, again, um, is kind of the jumping off point for where operant conditioning started. But how is a new skill learned? That was a question which began to fascinate Thorndike. To answer it, he built some ingenious puzzle boxes from which cats could only escape by operating latches. And in you go. The cat appears to be very clever in engineering its escape, solving the problem with a deftly placed paw and a push of its nose. But Thorndike didn't believe that an animal, even a clever cat, understands the consequences of its behavior. When he placed a cat in the puzzle box for the first time, Thorndike was unable to see any evidence of flashes of insight. The successful actions appeared first by chance. He proved that the apparent cleverness arose by trial and error, and used graphs to measure the rate of learning. A well-practiced cat quickly recalls the actions that help it escape to its reward of food. If an action brings a reward, Thorndike believed that that action becomes stamped into the mind.
In his thesis, he explained further his ideas about learning, that behavior changes because of its consequences. He called this his law of effect, which explained how even wild creatures develop new habits. So Thorndike's law of effect, um, again, was based off this idea of um, animals learning from their behavior, okay? So there was a behavior, and if that behavior was successful in the case of the puzzle box, they could get out and get food. If that behavior was unsuccessful, they weren't rewarded, um, and so they were less likely to do that behavior again. Um, and again, he did this, took trials to see how long it took them to get out and how learning was taking place. So here's a, an example of that. Um, so we see on um, the y-axis the time required to escape in seconds. Okay, so 60 seconds is a minute. So 240 seconds, we're talking about four minutes. Um, and so on average, it was taking about four minutes to get out of these puzzle boxes at the beginning. Um, by the end, by about 20, the, the 20th trial, um, they were getting out in less than a half a minute or in about a half a minute. So again, we see this learning was taking place. They really were figuring out the different ways to get out so that they could get this behavior rewarded. His law of effect said that rewarded behaviors were likely to reoccur and punished behaviors were less likely to reoccur. And again, this was the starting point for B.F. Skinner and his operant conditioning. He did a very similar kind of thing, except it wasn't about necessarily getting out. Um, he had what he called an operant chamber, or what psychologists affectionately call a Skinner box. Um, and this was a rat cage um, that had a couple of different key features. And it wasn't always rats, but um, a lot of behaviorism was done with animals. Um, as you've seen so far. Um, so the different um, pieces in an operant chamber include a bar or a lever um, that the animal will press um, or a disc that the animal could peck. It, again, depended on the kind of animal. So a rat, it's really easy for them to press a bar um, or a lever. Um, with a bird, it would be a disc that the animal can peck at. Um, again, these are behaviors that are voluntary behaviors that the, the animal can engage in. There was also some sort of reward involved here. Um, we had a food and water dispenser that would dispense the reward. Um, and it was, you know, whether the animal could figure out that you had to press the bar to get the food, or you had to press the bar three times to get the food, or you had to peck the disc seven times to get the reward. Um, and these animals would figure it out. Um, and just like with Lawn, uh, Thorndike's Law of Effect, we would see um, a decreased amount of time time to get that reward. Um, and then there was a recording device as well so that they could record what was going on um, in, the, um, in the, the operant chamber. So again, this idea um, of operant conditioning is really based on the idea that behaviors come first and then there's some sort of consequence afterwards. And a consequence can be a reinforcement um, that will increase the likelihood of that behavior, um, or it can be a punishment, which we'll talk about in a second. There's two different kinds of um, reinforcements that we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about positive reinforcement, um, and this is something that you kind of hear in our vernacular as well. And this is when you're adding, which is where the positive comes, comes from, something desirable. Now, in the case of it, this is reinforcement. So either way, this is going to be something um, that the the animal or the person feels better afterwards. In this case, they're adding something desirable. As in the Skinner box, they're adding food um, to that creature. So they're giving them positive reinforcement to increase the likelihood that they'll press that bar again. We can also have negative reinforcement, and that's gonna subtract something adverse, okay? Um, so say there was an annoying noise playing from that speaker in the operant chamber. Um, maybe pressing that bar seven times make that noise stop. Um, so again, that would be negative reinforcement, subtracting something adverse, but reinforcement is still there. We still feel better afterwards. Um, the annoying thing is gone or we got something desirable. Either way, we feel better afterwards after a reinforcement or the animal feels better afterwards after a reinforcement. And there's different kinds of reinforcement. There's a primary reinforcement that's gonna satisfy a biological need. Um, so food, 
would be, um, and water would be primary reinforcers. Um, secondary reinforcers are gonna gain its power through a relationship with a primary reinforcer. So money is a great example um, of a secondary reinforcer for humans. Um, in our culture, um, because you can buy food with money, you can buy um, drinks with money, you can buy things that will make you more attractive to the, um, the partner of your choosing, um, which is satisfies the biological need for sex. Um, again, these would be secondary. That's why money would be a secondary reinforcer. It can provide shelter, all these different things. It can um, pay for something um, in relationship to that primary need. Um, other examples of this would be um, a positive reinforcement. Um, so your dog, you call your dog, the dog comes. That's the voluntary behavior of the dog coming to you. Um, and the positive reinforcement is petting the dog, which the dog likes. Um, paying the person who paints your house. They paint your house. They choose to do that. You pay them through a secondary positive reinforcement of money. You can have negative reinforcement as well. And again, this is removing that adverse stimuli. Um, so you take painkillers, which is the voluntary action, to cause the pain to end, right? Because the painkillers will take away um, that negative um, stimulus of the pain. Um, when you get in your car, and if I'm trying to drive my daughter to the bus stop, which is just around the corner, sometimes I'm in a hurry and I don't always put on my seatbelt, but my car very quickly tells me that I have not put on my seatbelt. So even though, I mean, we're not even talking about, you know, a block and a half, um, I will buckle my seatbelt, um, even though I'm going like 15 miles an hour because I want that beeping to stop. It's so annoying. Um, I'm trying to remove that adverse stimuli. Um, so I'm being reinforced to buckle my seatbelt. So sometimes I'll just get in and just buckle it automatically. It doesn't matter where I'm going because I don't want it to be. I'm that behavior is being reinforced. Again, punishment are consequences that decrease the likelihood of that behavior happening again. Um, and these can be positive or negative in the exact same way. So again, a reinforcement is anything that's going to increase the likelihood that that behavior happens again. A punishment is anything that's going to decrease the likelihood of that behavior happening again. And the positive and the negative are the exact same thing. In a positive punishment, we're adding something undesirable. So again, positive and adding, those are synonymous. So we're adding something in undesirable. Um, and so again, that behavior is going to be followed by a negative stimulus. Um, a negative punishment is going to subtract something that's desired. Um, that behavior, that voluntary behavior is followed by removing a positive stimulus. Um, so if you, um, you know, you're walking your dog somewhere um, and your dog starts to kind of bark and go nuts um, at somebody or something and you pull the, the leash really hard and it pulls on the dog's neck, we're adding something undesirable. We're adding that kind of choke feeling, that kind of being pulled feeling on the leash, um, that's adding something undesirable. So that would be a positive punishment. Um, a negative punishment would be, again, taking away something that's desired. So the idea behind grounding um, is that it's still punishment, but you're losing something that you like. Um, so if you're grounded from TV, that's a negative punishment because your TV is being taken away. If you're grounded from your friends, that's negative punishment because your access to your friends is being taken away. Um, if you're grounded from driving, you're getting your driving privileges taken away. That's the same thing that happens with, you know, drunk drivers when they lose their driver's license. They're losing that opportunity. They're subtracting something that's desired, their ability to drive. Um, so those would all be examples of a negative punishment. Um, um, punishment. Other ones include a positive punishment. We're adding something undesirable, um, spraying water on a barking dog, um, giving a traffic ticket for speeding. Um, we're giving them something that's going on their record um, that's undesirable. And we can have a negative punishment too. Um, again, taking away the teen's driving privileges, revoking a library card for non-payment of fees, um, holding diplomas and transcripts um, for unpaid fees um, on universities, those would be negative punishments because they're taking away something um, that's wanted. So um, we talked a lot about 
examples of these punishments within um, the context of caregiving. Um, so like another positive punishment would be hitting. You're adding something undesirable. Um, so spanking would be a positive punishment. Um, what we actually see in terms of punishment and caregiving is while we do know that they, punishment in terms of operant conditioning lessens the chance of behavior happening again, that behavior is being suppressed. It's not being forgotten. Um, we're, if you're using this in a caregiving situation, children aren't saying, okay, well, I've forgotten now to say bad words or I've forgotten to be disrespectful. Um, I'm just suppressing that behavior. Um, and punishment is actually teaching discrimination among situations. So the behavior that they're getting punished for at home, they may be getting rewarded for um, in other contexts. So when you say a bad word in front of your parents and you get a punishment um, at home, you say that exact turn of phrase to your friends and you might get a laugh, um, which would be a reinforcement then. Um, we'd be, it would be a positive reinforcement. You're adding something pleasurable, your friends thinking you're funny, um, that laugh. Um, so punishment really teaches to discriminate among situations. It's not saying don't, it's not saying you're never gonna do this behavior again. It's just saying that you're gonna do it in a certain setting and not another one. Punishment can also really teach fear, especially when the punishments are really severe. Um, we can, because of that, we know um, about this associative learning, um, we can learn to associate the punishment with the person. Um, and that's really gonna be negative for relationships. Um, when a person, a caregiver is being associated with that negative, with those punishments, um, that's, that's not gonna be good for the, the the health of that relationship. Um, so again, they can associate that person with the punishment as well as just the punished behavior as well. We also know that physical punishment, again, that would be a positive punishment, adding um, any kind of physical pain, um, can really increase aggression. Um, we'll talk about this in observational learning, um, but it's teaching um, that that's how you handle a situation. So if you you hit a child um, because they do something bad, um, then you're teaching that child that when someone does something bad to them, they should hit them. Um, so again, there we do see that this can increase aggression as well. And we'll talk about that a little bit more when we get to observational learning lecture. And again, punishment is telling you what not to do. We really see, and you'll see that schools have really kind of moved to this, and this is why we hear positive reinforcement in kind of educational settings. It's a big um, buzzword in preschools, it's all about positive reinforcement, because positive reinforcement is really telling you what to do. Um, so instead of punishing a child, um, and I'm not saying you, I never punish my daughter, because I do, um, but instead of punishing my daughter when she's disrespectful, if I reward her when she's respectful, we see increases in those kinds of behaviors. That's the idea, is that positive reinforcement actually will increase those desired behaviors, um, which is really the end goal, right? Um, in the disrespectful, respectful situation, what you're looking for is your, a child to be respectful, right? And so we want to increase that likelihood of that happening again. And so reinforcement is actually more effective that way um, than punishment is. Okay, so let's move on um, to other facets of operant conditioning. Um, shaping. Shaping is um, a way that you can use operant conditioning um, to include a behavior that's not something that's naturally occurring, that's not something that the person can do voluntarily or the organism can do voluntarily on their own yet. They're going to be able to do it, but it's not something that they can do yet. Um, so potty training um, is one that shaping is used. So anytime a child kind of goes to the potty, whether, you know, they, you know, actually go in the potty or they go next to the potty, we're getting closer to the thing that we want of going in the potty. Or if they just say that they need to go to the potty, that behavior being rewarded, that would be shaping. Um, we can also see this a lot with pets and we'll watch a video that will kind of show that.
you can see, we're getting gradually and gradually closer to being able to turn on a light switch. This is done for, um, this video is online so that people can teach their dogs, people with disabilities, to be able to do these different things. You can see we're getting hot, closer and closer to being able to turn on the light switch. So I'm going to kind of zoom ahead um, so that we can see that we end up with the desired behavior. So you can see that um, shaping is when we're taking, it's taking the, the behavior that, that we want, in this case, turning a dog, turn, teaching a dog to turn on a light switch, which is not something dogs know how to do inherently. It's not a voluntary behavior that they have, but it can be taught. Um, and they're rewarding that behavior. Every time they did a piece of that, turning, touching the switch first was a treat, then flipping the switch was a treat. And then flipping the switch slightly more upright was a treat and more and more and closer to the wall became a, a treat. Um, so we, that was being a positive reinforcer was added the treat, um, which was a primary reinforcer um, after these behaviors. We can also have extinction in operant conditioning and extinction is just like it is in classical conditioning where we're no longer seeing that association, that gradual weakening of that association. And so that gradual disappearance of a response. Um, here's um, a video um, where they're trying to have this child um, go through extinction um, for this behavior. for extinction. Somewhere along the line, the child threw themselves down on the ground and started crying and got what they wanted, which was probably attention. Um, so they got a positive reinforcement. They were added something that they wanted, which was attention. Um, and so they learned, they had an association between throwing myself down on the ground and crying and getting a parent to pick me up um, and getting that positive attention. Um, and so what the parents are trying to do now is try to unpair those behaviors um, and have extinction. Um, if you notice each time that kind of the fit is, isn't as intense, um, we're starting to see that that weakening um, of that behavior. And again, the parents are hoping that it goes away completely um, um, in this situation. We also see that there can be schedules of reinforcement um, that can affect how quickly um, we learn these behaviors, how quickly these associations are formed, and how quickly extinction happens. So what we've talked about so far um, is continuous reinforcement. Um, and that's where every single time that behavior happens, a reinforcement or a punishment is given. Every single time. That's continuous. Um, these associations are learned really, really quickly. Um, so in the case of the child that's throwing itself on the ground crying, chances are it happened uh, maybe once or twice, um, and that was all kiddo needed um, to really make that association. Um, and so now they're hoping for a rapid extinction as well. Partial reinforcement is when you don't get that reinforcement every single time. Not every single time um, do you say thank you and please, are you rewarded with, you have such nice manners. Um, not every single time do you do that, do you say that, do you get that reward. But you, you get enough positive feedback for doing those things that you continue to do them. Um, but it's a partial learning, it's a partial schedule of reinforcement. 
Um, so it took you a while to learn it. It wasn't something that you picked up just like that. You had to learn that um, as you grew up. Some of us are still learning that. Um, that, you know, that being respectful to others can be it can be better. Um, what's nice about partial reinforcement is it has a greater resistance to extinction. Um, because you don't expect to get this reinforcement every single time it happens, when it doesn't happen, you're not all of a sudden like, oh my gosh, these things aren't associated anymore. There's no point in doing this behavior. Um, so we see this extinction um, is less likely to happen. Um, they're more resistant to it with partial. Now we can have different kinds of, reinforce, of partial reinforcement. This table is talking about four different kinds of reinforcement schedules that are partial. Um, and they're based on two different things. Um, so variable is after, it's an about, it's about unpredictability. Um, whereas fixed is about, it's a certain number, okay? So um, either it's a certain number of times or it's a certain amount of, uh, it happens every certain amount of time or however so many times. Um, ratio is really about um, every time it happens, the number of things that happen, and intervals about length of time. Okay, so we can have a ratio, a fixed ratio schedule that says it's every so many. So when you, I have a TCBY card um, that my daughter and I use, and every time we get a frozen yogurt, we get a punch. Um, when you get to 10, you get a free frozen yogurt. That's a ratio, a fixed ratio schedule of reinforcement. I'm getting my punch this so, so that I can get my free um, ice cream at the end, which is my reinforcement is that free ice cream. Um, that would be a fixed ratio. Um, a fixed um, interval would be every so often. So there's certain um, discounts that are only on Tuesdays. Um, kids eat free on this day of the week. Um, that would be a fixed interval schedule of reinforcement. We want you to come to this restaurant um, and you can come to this restaurant and get um, this, this reinforcement, this discount on this certain day. Um, a variable ratio would be an after an unpredictable number. Um, so this would be like a slot machine. Um, so you sit down at the slot machine, you know eventually this is going to pay out sometime, which is why you sit there for so long and you keep putting money in the slot machine is because it will eventually cash out. But the question is, are you going to be sitting there when it does? Um, fishing is going to be like that too. You're not going to, it's, you get the reward, but it's over a variable um, amount. Um, we don't know when it's going to happen, um, and, but it's about number of tries. You, it can't happen if you don't try. Um, and in variable interval, it's unpredictably often. Um, so this would be, um, you know, checking your email or Facebook for a response. Um, you know, you're going to eventually get a response from somebody. If you send a text message to somebody um, that you care about and they care about you, they're going to eventually respond, but you don't exactly know when. Um, but when they do, you're going to get that reward um, of that response. We see that different kinds of these fixed ratio, variable ratio, fixed interval, and variable interval um, have different learning rates and different extinction rates too. Um, so we'll see that both of the ratio schedules, um, you're going to learn them a lot quicker, um, but um, they're going to also be more likely to then be um, more susceptible to extinction. Um, whereas the intervals um, we're going to see are going to kind of take a little bit more time to get, um, but because the length of time is there, um, we may have a little bit more resistance to extinction. Okay, so this ends our conversation about operant conditioning.